The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. Main standing, we'll read Romans uh, 6, uh, 8 through 14. We're going to consider 8 through 13. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Thus far God's uh, holy word. May be seated. Well, you children uh, sometimes will do things simply because you trust your parents. So I don't know if you've been in the swimming pool yet or learned to swim, but uh, I can see my own grandchildren and their dad stands or I stand in the pool and say, now jump to me and I will catch you and I will hold you. And, you know, they don't want to do that. They don't think they can do that. But because they trust, they have confidence in their father or their grandfather, they'll jump in the pool right into his arms. Because we trust, we have confidence in our parents. And there's lots of things that we'll do because we have confidence in our parents. Now, for us as Christians, there's lots of things that we don't do or procrastinate because we lack confidence. I don't know about you, but I really, if I've not done something before or I have some doubt if I can really do it, I put it off. I just just procrastinate it because I'm just, I'm afraid of it. Now this is also true of us spiritually. But the Lord God wants us, as we deal with the arduous character of the Christian life, this race that we're running, this pilgrimage, that we're on, there's all kinds of obstacles, there are enemies, there are snares, there are traps, and of course there are our own hearts and the, the danger that yet lurks therein. And we sometimes are diffident, we hold back, uh, we give in to sin. I hear people saying, I just can't help myself. And that's not what the Savior wants for you today. He wants you to know that you have victory. Victory in Jesus. Not quite like the old song, but still, victory in Jesus. And he actually uses, the Apostle Paul uses the objection to his gospel of free grace to introduce this theme. So last week, as we started in chapter 6, and Paul anticipates the objection, do we sin that grace might abound? And he says, Uh, Let it not be, God forbid, how can we who have died to sin live therein? And that's where he establishes this principle. He makes this declaration that as Christians, we have died to sin. Now the mind boggles at that. And so Paul goes on now to use your baptism to demonstrate to you the reality that because of covenant with Christ, you died and were raised with him. And because of union with Christ in conversion, the Spirit of Christ then applies to each of you, to all of us, uh, the crucifixion and death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. That is the very reality of our conversion experience of being born again. Having laid that foundation, now the apostle wants us to be confident about this victory that is ours in Christ Jesus. So what I want to show you this morning is that because of union with Christ, the believer has victory over sin. 
because of union with Christ, the believer has victory over sin. And we'll consider two things, the confidence of the believer and the responsibility of the believer. We begin then in verse 8 with the confidence that the believer has that he will have victory over sin. You notice that Paul begins with the word now in the New American Standard. He has laid out this reality of the, of the work of conversion that the Spirit has applied the death and dying of Christ to us and our old self then crucified with Christ covenantally has also died in order that our body of sin would be done away with so we're no longer slaves to sin. Now, now he says now, what does this mean? If we've died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. If you've died in covenant with Christ in His work, if you've died in covenant with Christ in the work of conversion, then you know that you are living in Him. You have life in Him. This is the confidence that Paul wants us to have as we look at sin. No, because I've died with Christ, I am living with Him. The confidence is based upon two realities, the finality of Christ's death and the perfection of Christ's life. Paul first directs our attention uh, to the finality of Christ's death. If we've died with Christ, we believe that we live with Him knowing, now he's proven his point. You see, remember what I've said to you, this is a very tight, it's one of the densest passages in Paul tightly argued, knowing then that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. So in a number of ways, Paul is just driving home this point that Christ's death was final, that he died once and for all to sin. And in doing so, he has defeated death and death's the executioner and the prison house of sin. Paul says this is proven by his resurrection. That because he's been raised, he's raised never to die again. Now remember the parallel from chapter 5. That Adam is the covenant head brought death upon all those who come from him by ordinary birth. So that gives you one exception, the one born of the virgin. But that death that Adam brought the whole human race into was a physical death and a spiritual death and an eternal death of condemnation. And as such, Paul said that he is a figure of Christ in that representative capacity and the consequences of it. But um, as he took our place... Christ then dealt with death. He dealt with physical death by dying, that he would defeat it. He dealt with uh, spiritual death by himself being uh, rejected and cursed and thus dealt with the eternal condemnation of death. And so what's Paul saying? That Christ's death was a representative and judicial death he died to sin, which means then that he has defeated sin and death. That is our confidence then that um, as he died, we died in him. Now the second reality that Paul lays out before us is the perfect life of Christ. So he uses the resurrection to prove the finality of death. In verse 9, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Um, death no longer is the master of the death. He died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Now Paul's not simply saying that he rose again from the dead. No, now he's talking about the perfect life that belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw last week he was raised by the glory of God. 
the very glory of God bestowed upon him in this powerful and glorious act. He's now exalted uh, to uh, the glory of God, figuratively spoken of as sitting at the right hand of, of majesty on high. I was reading this week, and I trust the more you read the Psalms, the more you will see our Savior uh, in the Psalms. And, and also see how the Psalms relate. So Psalm 20 and 21 and 22 all relate to the humiliation and exaltation of the Christ. And it's because of that that he's our shepherd. But in Psalm uh, 21, as David speaks on behalf of Christ, he says in verse 2, You've given him his heart's desire, and you've not withheld the good request of his lips. For you meet him with the blessings of good things. You set a crown of fine gold on his head. He asked life of you and you gave it to him. And remember what Hebrews says, he was heard for his crime. Length of days, forever and ever. His glory is great through your salvation. Splendor and majesty you place upon him. For you made him most blessed forever. You make him joyful with gladness in your presence. That's the background of what Paul says. He is alive um, to God. He lives to God. He's crowned with glory and honor and splendor. And that's a declaration that nothing else need be done objectively. But not only for your justification, the pardon of your sins and your legally constituted righteous, your adoption, being brought in the family of God, but your sanctification. Objectively, there's nothing left to be done. Because Christ satisfied the penalty of sin, and he's now exalted as the perfect prophet, priest, and king in all splendor and glory. And that, you see, is the guarantee of victory. That's why you have confidence. Here's Christ standing. He says, you do not need to doubt or fear because I have completely accomplished everything to save you now and to take you safely and securely to myself in glory. Now you must, dear friends, build your lives upon that foundation. Testified to you by your baptism that you were covenantally in union with Christ when he did his work. You are in union with Christ now through conversion as the Spirit of Christ applies that work to you in your regeneration where you've been crucified and you've been raised with him. And as Paul even says, because of this union, you are seated with him in the heavenly places. But this confidence then of victory brings us to a responsibility. Unfortunately, some evangelicals get half the truth right here and then they stop. So I talked about that uh, uh, hymn. Victory in Jesus is a very catchy tune, and you young folks probably don't know it, but uh, it just verges on the edge of truth. <laughs> uh, it's a great statement about the sovereignty of God's grace and love and everything else, but um, it's, it gives the impression that this victory is complete in our experience of everyday living. Now, it is the basis, it is the basis of victory in everyday living. But it le God leaves us with a responsibility. So victory in Jesus is not let go and let God. It's not practice spiritual breathing. It's not reckon yourself, I'm a child of God, and so all I have to do is think about my justification. No, Paul brings us to two responsibilities that we have here because of the victory that is ours in Christ. And the first responsibility is to practice the power of spiritual thinking. Not the power of positive thinking, but to practice the power of spiritual thinking. So in verse 11, and I'll notice again the conclusion, even so, because of this, because you died in Christ, because his death was final, because he's exalted in heaven, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. What a glorious statement. Paul basically says you've got to think about yourself in this capacity. You've got to have the soliloquy. You've got to preach to yourself. As David models for us, for example, in Psalm 
42, 5. Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. That's what Paul is saying here that you need to do. You need to start talking to yourself. Consider yourself. Think about yourself. Reckon yourself to be dead to sin. This is what Professor Murray has popularized as definitive sanctification. He stated in, in the Confession of Faith that we're no longer under the dominion of sin. And because we are dead to sin and alive to God, we do not have to sin. The bondage is broken. Now, when I say that, surely someone is questioning or objecting. What about these Christians that are struggling with a life dominating sin like alcohol or drugs or pornography? Well, the fact that the dominion is broken, God in His promise doesn't always break the consequences of dominion. And here's the analogy I've thought about. I think this is, is valid. We've all heard stories of a person who had been kidnapped and finally freed. Now, in the freedom, they're delivered now from the kidnappers. They're delivered from their <coughs> captivity. But things happen in captivity. Sometimes they actually develop a dependency upon their captors. Other times there are going to be psychological issues. And so what you have is, yes, they've been freed. They've been freed from the bondage of captivity, but they are paying the consequences of that, either in a dependence upon their captors or in some scars that mark their lives. Well, I think that's exactly what is happening. We are freed from the dominion of sin. Satan no longer has claim on us. We have been set free, but we have the consequences where our bodies, our minds, our affections have been rewired by improper sinful patterns. And God in His providence sometimes breaks all those wires immediately, but sometimes He doesn't. For His own glory and the, and the well-being even of the Christian, God takes time. In fact, if you're in that situation, that's what's going on. But then you still need to realize today that uh, sin is not your master. And you don't have to do it. And so you seek the grace of Christ. You seek accountability. You use the means of grace to see the pattern broken. But the pattern doesn't mean that the dominion has not been broken. You need to understand that. And so Christ wants you men and ladies today to think of yourselves dead to sin. So when the temptation to sin comes, where were we last week? You take your baptism. Now my baptism tells me that I've died to sin and I'm alive to Christ and I do not have to do it. You've got to start talking to yourselves. You've got to start seeking the Spirit to apply to you the reality of who and what you are in Christ Jesus. And that is an important key to victory over sin. Reckon yourself. Consider yourself dead to sin. Live, practice the power of spiritual thinking. That leads to practice the work of spiritual enlistment. It, Paul uses military figures in verses 12 and 13. Notice he's building still. So he lives to God. Even so, think about yourselves. Therefore, as you think about yourself dead to sin, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you may obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments or weapons of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of the righteousness to God. So here's what is going to grow out of this power of spiritual thinking is an enlistment. 
In the first place, he's reminding us then that we're not to let sin reign. It has been broken, thus it has no right to rule in our lives. Now, perhaps you're wondering, why does he talk about the mortal body here? We're not Platonist. We don't think that there's sin in that which is physical and material. No, we don't. But we also recognize that the troika of lust, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life acts through what? Our minds, our hands, our eyes, our feet. The body is the primary instrument of much of sin. And that's why Paul speaks in this way, that we must not let sin reign in our mortal bodies so as to obey the lust. No, we must be busy then to put these lusts to death and not to let them reign. So he gives it both negatively and positively with respect to enlistment. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. So we're dead to sin. That means we're not in Satan's army. He doesn't reign over us. So quit giving yourself over to him, uh, giving your body, uh, fulfilling these lusts uh, in the pursuit of unrighteousness. That's betrayal. I read a story once of Alexander the Great. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's a great story, as most of them are, um, that a young soldier is brought to him and um, who had turned his back in battle. And the great Alexander said, uh, son, what's your name? And with just barely a whisper, he said, Alexander, sir. Son, what is your name? Alexander, sir. Speak up. What is your name? Alexander, sir. And then he said, Alexander is a great son. Change your ways or change your name. Isn't that what Paul is telling us here? What is your name? Christian, sir. I'm Christ-like. I'm enlisted in his army. I serve him. So he says, change your name if you're not going to change your ways. Quit presenting your bodies as instruments in the pursuit of unrighteousness. We'll follow up more with that next week. And then, but positively, present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. This power of Christ by the Spirit is now at work in you, enabling you to die to sin and grow in conformity to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. So present yourselves alive from the dead and your members of your body instruments to righteousness, the service of God. And so here we have it put together. Union with Christ, union covenantally in His work objectively, union by conversion in His work of regeneration by the Spirit means that we are dead to sin, alive to Christ, we reckon ourselves dead to sin, and we now begin to pursue righteousness in the service of Christ. And we should have this confidence, and it's out of this confidence, out of the surety of victory, that we then pursue sanctification. The confession of the larger catechism puts it together for us in a wonderful way. Sanctification is a work of God's grace, whereby they whom God hath before the foundation of the world chosen to be holy are in time through the powerful operation of His Spirit, applying the death and resurrection of Christ unto them, renewed in their whole man after the image of God, having the seeds of repentance unto life and all other saving graces put into their hearts and those graces so stirred up, increased and strengthened, as that they more and more die into sin and rise unto newness of life. Friends, particularly you men who are going to be ministers, but all Christians, are you obsessed with the confident pursuit of holiness? I thought this morning about those wonderful words from McShane, that it's not so much talents that God blesses as likeness to Christ.
That's what God will bless. Then your ministry will be powerful. Oh, how the church today. Yes, we want to sharpen your gifts. We want to do all that we can in God's providence. But gentlemen, the most important thing in serving as a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ is Christ-likeness. Now is the time with confidence that you establish these habits and these pursuits. That this is the closest thing you're going to have to a monastery with the privilege of being married while you're in monastery. It's the most respite you're going to have the rest of your life. So you must be about it. You must be about mortification. You must be putting to death then the sin that yet reigns in your body. By the power of the Spirit, as you tell yourself that you are dead to sin, you then bring these lusts and you ask Christ to nail them to the cross, to kill them. You don't put yourself into positions where you know you're going to be tempted. But because you've enlisted in the service of Christ, you avoid people and circumstances. Just Darren and I were talking this morning and how he's had to cut himself off from so much of the, the previous circles of his life. But that's part of putting sin to death. But the Spirit of Christ will do that. But we are to use the means. And then to pursue that likeness to Christ. His image is before us in the scriptures, in God's holy law, we use then the means of grace depending upon the Spirit who raised Christ from the dead to give you the power to grow in conformity to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, we thank you for this wonderful declaration of victory that you give to us. Help us to believe it and to live on the basis of it. Oh, God, make us a holy generation. As, and McShane would pray another place, Lord, make us as godly as a man or a woman can be in this world. Make us a generation that stands out for holiness and Christ's likeness. Oh, give us holy affections, Lord. It's all ours in Christ, and we're only asking to give to us those things that Christ has purchased for us. As we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu.